We yeah. did not think we were going to be getting a puppy, yet we wound up with one. Yeah. That's how it works, typically. I know, like, <clears throat> like a month ago, you're like, uh, maybe. We've been back and forth on it forever now. Yeah. So it was a conversation for literally the whole last year of, like, do we want to go back to four dogs or not? Blah, blah, yeah. blah. We're like, three's pretty easy, whatever. We yeah. don't really want to go back to four. That's we true. were back and forth on what kind of breed we wanted. Yeah. We were looking at Dutch Shepherds. We were looking at Rottweilers. We were looking at all the oh, cool geez. breeds yeah. like that, you know? <laughs> and uh, so we were just in Savannah. And uh, <clears throat> while we were out there, we were we were on Tybee Island, and we were Tybee. having some beverages. Okay. And I pull up my phone, and, and I'm looking, I'm scrolling, and I see there's a little picture of a little puppy on Mary Jo Demansky's page, who uh, is a part of a couple of local rescues. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, oh, my God, this is the cutest dog I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Little waffles, huh? Little waffles. So she was posting all these pictures. We'd look at them. I was like, oh, my God, should we adopt this dog? Like, half-jokingly. Yeah. Know? And then the the friends that we were with out there just decided to then just egg it on for the whole remainder of the trip. Yeah. So for, like, the next <laughs> three days, anytime we were, like, drinking, they'd just be like, so, when are you guys getting waffles? Yeah. When's the meet and greet with waffles? <laughs> What's going on with that? Blah, blah, blah. So we got back. <laughs> we set up the meet and greet. And... uh Literally, that came to the house last Thursday. She brought him over, mm-hmm. and we were like, "Oh man, he's pretty cool." Well, you know, what's it going to be like having a puppy? And I literally told her, "I was like, well, can you just like leave him for a couple of days?" Mm-hmm. And she was like, "Yeah, I mean, I guess." So she left him for a couple of days, and a couple of days turned into a week. A week turned into us filling out the adoption application yesterday, and I mean, we haven't like paid yet, but like they haven't invoices yet for yeah. it. So, but I think he's, I think he's like officially ours. Yeah. This so. seems like this is to be like the easiest dog you've ever owned so far. <laughs> Vera was pretty easy. Yeah. Um, we'll see, though, because he's got some quirks to him that we'll get into here. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there's some things we're kind of trying to uh, work through with him. He's a, he's a little bit of a weenie. <laughs> he's kind of, yeah. you know, easily scared by things. <laughs> So we're trying to yeah. take our time because he's a sensitive boy, yeah. you know. Yeah, he likes to but sleep. But he, he likes to sleep a lot. Like he's literally, we just have him back tied to the chair right now. Yeah. He's snoozing under the table right now, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and he's pretty cool with just doing that. And then he gets these little spurts of uh, the puppy energy, you know. Okay. But this is the thing, right? So puppies sleep like literally all day long. Yeah. Right. You got so was Bender eight weeks old when you got him? Yeah, uh, ten weeks by the time we got him. But mm-hmm. yeah, I mean. This is going to be interesting. So I want to talk a little bit about like things that you did with Bender when you first got him, things that we're doing with this puppy right now. Okay. And I want to try to find some similarities behind like the idea of obviously raising a dog, right? Okay. So having a puppy mm-hmm. is something that I feel like, you know, a lot of people get puppies. We had a lot of puppies that come in for training, like people doing mm-hmm. it right, trying to learn everything as early as possible with the dog. Mm-hmm. Uh, and typically our puppy program starts around 14 weeks. You know, like yeah. if we're going to actually start doing training and stuff with the dog. Uh, typically 14 weeks is the age in which we're going to start doing that. Um, mm-hmm. But from the second the dog comes into the house, there's a lot of things you could do to help avoid a lot of problems later on. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think this is the biggest mistake a lot of people make is um, everything from how they socialize these young dogs mm-hmm. to um, the structures and routines they're setting up with these dogs to the habits they allow the dog to develop early on. Uh, these mm-hmm. are all issues that you could you could really kind of weasel yourself around if you know what you're doing pretty yeah. successfully and avoid most of the problems that you have later on. Yeah. Right. A lot of these issues we have people come in when they have a, a seven month old dog to a year and a half old dog are issues that typically we allow the dog to develop mm-hmm. early on because we don't know what we're doing. Yep. Right. So Josh, what was your first, what was your first week like with Bender when you got him? First week. Uh, I mean, he, it was amazing actually. <laughs> It was the easiest transition I've ever had with a like, with a dog. I think. Um, I mean, the first night he came home, like we had to go down to Tennessee to get him. Um, he went in our in the crate in the car. Fine. He whimpered for like ten minutes and it was good. Never cared about his family again. Thankfully. <laughs> but uh, no, when we got him home the first night, I mean, immediately. Went in the crate when we went, when we got home. Went to bed. Mm-hmm. Um, he whined for 
few hours. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I mean, he was accustomed to it. And we did, I mean, we did crating all the way until maybe like a year ago. And when he was like a year old, we finally like, yep. Like allowed him to be, be free in the, in our room. But, uh, I mean, I don't know, man. Like he potty trained really easy. Mm -hmm. Um, he only had accidents when we like were lax. We, we weren't like keeping him on the tight leash, which we stopped immediately after he had an accident, but he only had like two or three accidents and then he, he got it right away. Yep. Um, I don't know. We were feeding him a cup a day food. Yep. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, we so, go ahead. No, go ahead and finish what you're going to say. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, he, yeah, he did a lot <laughs> of sleeping. I mean, we would play with him for like an hour and then he would be out for four. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. So how much of this stuff do you equate to, um, you know, like he potty trained easily. He didn't give you a hard time. He was pretty good in the crate, stuff like that. Mm. How much do you equate that to him just as the dog that he is versus things that you guys were doing? Um, doing or not doing, I should say. Yeah, I think that I we we probably yeah, knew exactly what we were doing a little bit more because I'd been following you, you know you for two years and mm-hmm. she'd been working at uh at heights for four yeah. years you know so i'm sure it played a big role into how easy it was for us um, sure but also i don't know i don't know if his breed really i mean he's a cattle dog for anyone that hasn't listened yet but i don't know if that really helped or not you mm-hmm. know sure yeah i i so so i would i would i would beg to say you know with a lot of these things <clears throat> It's more so the things you guys were doing and the things you guys were aware of. Because, so here's the thing, right? I uh, I I had this dog out a couple days ago with a with a friend of mine, and you know he's asking about you know how the dog is going, yeah, training this that. And I told him I was like I I looked at the leash, right? This leash that he's on right now, yeah. And I was like, this leash literally has not come off of this dog since I've had him, yeah. Right? He's literally been on a leash unless he's in a crate, yeah. Right? He is. On this leash. Yeah. Right? Yep. And a lot of the reason for that is because when you have a dog that's as young as this, your number one job here is to be able to micromanage absolutely every single part of the dog's life. Yeah. Every single part of it. Oh, yeah. Right? There should not be a thing that the dog does that you are not there to be able to communicate if you like it or you don't like it. Mm -hmm. Right? And that right there is the single most important thing I think you could do with a young dog and the single most important thing that I see people not do, which causes a lot of problems, right? Yeah. This dog is not trained, right? Yeah. This dog does not know any commands, right? Mm. He doesn't know sit. He doesn't know down. He doesn't know come. He doesn't know stay. Nope. He doesn't know how to, you know, well, he kind of is learning how to walk on a leash, but like he doesn't yeah. know heel, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, he doesn't know his name, frankly, at this point, Yeah. right? Yeah. And a lot of people go into having puppies with the expectation they should know all these things. And they're Mm -hmm. like, oh, we're going to teach the dog all of these things by starting to just use them in our day-to-day, which Mm -hmm. is the absolute worst thing that you could do, right? Because immediately, if I were to start throwing out commands all the time to this dog, what would happen is I would teach him at a very young age, at 14 weeks, I would teach him that my words are irrelevant because none of them have any sort of meaning to Mm -hmm. them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what I want to do here is I'm going to break down basically everything that I did with this dog in the first week. Okay. Right? We'll, and, and and forgive me, my memory isn't what it used to be, but <laughs> I will try to recall everything it was. Right? Yeah. Okay. So again, last Thursday, um, we got this dog. She came for the meet and greet, brought him in. So he originally, they had pulled him from like, like I said, like an Amish kind of situation, right? He was like living in like a horse stall basically with a couple of brothers and sisters that he had. Mm. Uh, and it was him and it was his sister, right? Mm. And the foster, Mary Jo had him for a little bit and then she got his sister a couple of days into it, I believe. Mm. Um, so litter mates, obviously, right? Not a good idea to have them together typically for this long. Typically mm. once you start getting past like 10 weeks or so, you really want to start separating them because mm. they will start developing those like attachment issues with each other that cause litter mate syndrome that yeah. we see as a big problem later on in life, right? Mm. Uh, and honestly, some of the issues that we're seeing with him right now, I would almost equate to the fact that he was with that sister for as long as he is, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so she brings him in. She had both of them, actually. Good. Um, and 
I needed to see how this dog was going to be in a new environment, and I wanted to see how he was going to do with my dogs, right? Mm-hmm. I wanted to kind of assess his overall temperament, yeah. right? So I had my dogs out in the living room downstairs. I had them all in downstays, right? I, and I wish I took a, I, you know, I told myself when I was get it, when I get a puppy that I was going to videotape fucking everything to be able mm-hmm. to show everybody everything. Yeah. I didn't do that. <laughs> I don't think I videotaped anything yet. Yeah. So far, right. <laughs> and there's been some shit that I'm like, man, like this would be cool yeah. if I had that on video because it's really good, instructional, yeah. stuff like that, mm-hmm. whatever. So all my dogs ran downstairs when she came in the house. Right. Um, and what I did was I had her come in. I had her set both puppies on the ground, and I kind of had the living room, dining room area blocked off, right? Mm -hmm. So had them set on the ground, let them just kind of run amok. First things that I noticed was actually a little interesting. So he seemed really confident coming in. Like he came in full of energy, running around, running up to the other dogs and stuff like that. And the sister seemed pretty timid, right? She Mm -hmm. seemed like she was definitely shying, uh, shying away, stuff like that. And then over the course of like the hour that she was here or so, started to kind of loosen up and then seemed like she was definitely like a clinger to people, right? Mm -hmm. But he seemed very much kind of like he was doing his own thing. He yeah. wasn't as interested in just running up to all the people and stuff. Okay. Right? Yeah. So whatever. He kind of, once he sniffed the dogs and realized they weren't doing anything, um, kind of, you know, did his own thing, went off, sniffed around, stuff like that. He didn't seem like he was overly interested or pushy in them, right? Um, but like I said, him and his sister were pretty close together. They kind of did the same thing together like the whole time, right? Mm-hmm. So whatever, seemed fine. I uh, told her, you know, we want to keep the dog for a couple of days, kind of see how it goes. So she's getting ready to leave. And um, I go, I, I put a leash on him, right? And uh, she's walking out with the sister. And he goes to try to pull towards the sister. He feels the leash and absolutely flipped his shit, dude. Like <laughs> screaming, bucking yeah. at the end of the leash, back flipping, fucking going back bonkers right dang <laughs> and i looked at her i was like has you ever been on a leash before she said nope <laughs> uh. never right so we got a 14 week old dog now that's never been on a leash before mm. right again big issue that we'll see a lot of people make is yeah. they carry these dogs around everywhere right mm-hmm. and what happens is a leash is a very abnormal thing to dogs right you put it on them and it's a man-made thing that holds them back from stuff it's something where they need to give it they need to understand this concept of giving into the pressure understanding yep. how to move with it and stuff and we think this is just an inherent thing that dogs should know how to do where frankly a lot of young dogs do not have a good idea of this and we coddle to it by again when they put the brakes on or stop doing something we can just yeah. pick them up right this is a small mm-hmm. dog right now so yeah. I just pick them up and carry them around if I need to, yeah. right? So whatever. I told myself, listen, all right, I'm not worried about this right now. So I just kind of dropped the leash, let him do his thing for a minute. Mm-hmm. And I started off by for maybe a half an hour or so, let him just drag the leash around. I wanted to get him used to the weight of this thing, mm-hmm. feeling something around his neck and okay. not being quite as averse to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So she leaves, and I could equate some of this maybe to, like, his sister was leaving, she was leaving, yeah. and he had never been on a leash before. <clears throat> That's kind of what was going through my head initially, yeah. right? So I put my other dogs away. We put them outside for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mostly did that because anytime you have a new dog that's making a huge ruckus like that, especially a small dog screaming, yelping, bucking, stuff like that, that could really trigger like a deeply ingrained kind of prey drive thing in your dogs. And this is stuff you want to be aware of. Right, mm-hmm. because that can cause a problem later on. These dogs don't have a relationship with each other. They're seeing this thing showing all these signs of weakness and arousal, and that could cause dogs to want to really pounce on that. Right. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so put them away. Had the leash. I need to get ready to go to work here in a couple minutes. Right. So I was like, all right. Well, we are starting our first official leash pressure session. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I had a regular um, six foot slip lead on this dog. Yep. Right. And we start the basics. Right. And the basics are. Not leash walking, not healing, not anything like that. The basics are understand what to do when you feel pressure on your neck, Mm -hmm. right? So I hold this leash, grab the handle of it. I walk until the dog feels pressure on the collar, and then I just stand there, Mm -hmm. right? And I post myself up, and he pulls against it, starts doing the bucking, doing the little yelping, tries to run left or tries to run (laughs) right, you know, tries to figure out what he needs to do. And finally, he turns and he gives way, right? And he takes a couple steps towards me. Good, right? Praise him up, right? Tell him he's doing a good job. Let him know you like it, right? Mm -hmm. Repeat that process. Repeat that process. Repeat that process, right? Mm. Little by little. I mean, he was still pretty shitty with it at this point. Like, he wasn't (laughs) doing too great with it, right? Um, But he was starting to, over time, like, I could tell the fight was getting a little less and less each time. Yeah. 
listen, we get to the stairs to go down to the garage and stuff like that. I'm like, I'm not even crossing this bridge yet. Right? Yeah. I'm not worried about it yet. So I kind of pick them up. I'm, I'm managing that for right now, right? Mm-hmm. Until I have time to kind of designate a full session of that and load them up in the car, go to take them to work, right? Put them in the crate in the back of my car, screams like a maniac mm-hmm. in the crate the entire time we're mm-hmm. headed to the shop. Again, new situation. Uh, he's been in crates before, but not in a car maybe. He's moving mm-hmm. around, stuff like that whatever made a ruckus you know mm. <clears throat> so we get to the shop same deal get them in i do the leash pressure work all the way into the front of the building then we have stairs going up to the second floor again mm. not kind of worried about that right now pick them up carry them up stick them in a crate same deal freaks the fuck out in the crate for like 30 minutes probably mm-hmm. and then finally kind of chilled out a little bit right but i'm not avoiding any of these big problems yet right so i've noticed two major things right off the rip in the in day one with this dog right mm-hmm. one he definitely needed work in the crate yeah two he definitely needed work with the leash mm-hmm. right um Outside of that, he didn't seem too bad with jumping. He didn't seem too bad with mouthing or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I tried to manage those things when I did see them. Obviously, I didn't, you know, if he tried to jump on me, I quickly got him off. If yeah. he mouthed at me, I quickly stopped interacting with him. Mm-hmm. And a lot of this initially, we're using, you want to get into the science of learning, we're using negative punishment for these types of things, right? So mm-hmm. I'm removing something, my interaction, in order to discourage these behaviors, right? Mm-hmm. If I'm petting him and he starts jumping on me, I completely stop interacting with him altogether, yeah. right? Remove moving the reinforcement behind him jumping, right? Yep. Uh, if he's biting at me, I stop interacting with him altogether, right? And initially, your goal with young dogs is to be able to stop these behaviors with as little aversion as possible, mm-hmm. right? You don't want to have to go in with really firm corrections right off the rip, right? So by doing those types of things, you could at least begin to set the tone of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And that gets into other things that people typically will do wrong, is when they see their dog start doing these types of things, they tell them, no, no bite, this, that, right? And they're like kind of interacting with the dog the whole time that they're trying to discourage it. Yeah. So the dog has no idea what no and no bite is and stuff like that. They mm-hmm. just know that, wow, I'm doing this behavior and I'm still getting attention right now, right? Yeah. So step number one, guys, again, just cut the interaction all yeah. the Literally get up and walk away when the dog starts doing that. Yeah. And I know this is harder as the dog gets older, obviously. And as a dog gets older, you need to resort to corrections. But I'm talking if you get an eight-week-old dog in, the dog has no pre-associations with getting away with anything, yeah. right? This is arguably their first time they've ever tried to do these behaviors. If you start yeah. the process teaching it that way, it typically will go away pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, he really, like, after the first couple of days, like, he doesn't really jump, you know? Like, yeah. he doesn't jump on anybody. He yeah. doesn't really mouth at me or anything like that, right? He's kind mm-hmm. of understood the gist of things. And now that I've kind of clearly established that with him, that I don't like it in a non-aversive fashion, mm-hmm. as he gets a little bit older and as his energy picks up and he gets more rambunctious and more testy and stuff like that, if I need to actually give a correction for it, which I will, right? Inevitably, I'll need to correct for the behavior at some point. It's going to be more clearly understood because I've already set the tone of it, Mm -hmm. right? So take him to the shop, put him in the crate, um, started kind of, you know, finally chilled out after about 30 minutes, uh, let him out every couple hours, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And for the most part, again, I haven't done anything with this dog aside from have him on a leash and start getting him used to feeling that pressure. Mm -hmm. And then uh, obviously stick him in a crate uh, when I'm not able to supervise him. Yeah. Right. Uh, since he's, he's not eight weeks old, you know, he's, he's, you know, a month older than obvi- that, obviously he could hold his bladder a little bit longer. So I'm not taking mm-hmm. him out truly every two hours. Like I would with a really, really young dog, yeah, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. but I am trying to take him out fairly regularly every three to four hours or so, you know, uh, he seemed like he was fairly good with getting the concept of once I took him outside, going to the bathroom. Uh, so that wasn't a huge issue. And then, um, that evening, kept it low-key. We took him in the living room, uh, back-tied him off to a chair with a leash just like we have him right now, mm-hmm. and just taught him to essentially be okay with doing nothing. It was a long day, a lot of stimulation and stuff, so he was pretty tired, right? Yeah. All right, nighttime, get ready, put him in the crate, put him in the crate, freak the fuck out in the crate at night. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it was like... <laughs> It was legitimately like a like 30 minutes of freaking out, and then he kind of chilled out, and then I think he woke up again at like 2.30, freaked the fuck out, right, and then chilled out after like 20 minutes, and yeah. I think he did so again in the morning, right? Oh, jeez. It was, it was a lot, right? Yeah. But here's the thing, right? This is the big it, thing I tell everybody. You sign up for this when you get a puppy. That's true. You do. Is the, is the crate in the same room or a different room? It's in the basement. Okay. 
Now, uh, yeah, so good point with that. So a lot of times I typically will recommend you could just keep it in your bedroom with you, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it'll help the dog chill out much faster just being in the same place. The way that I kind of (laughs) typically do things is I'm going to get the dog to adjust to the things I need to get them to do. Yeah. Right? So even though it's a lot further away, I will tough through it for four or five days, you know, just Mm -hmm. to get past that issue so it's something I don't have to worry about later on. Yeah. You know? Um, Again, it's kind of clear that he had some confinement anxiety issues. I don't know if it was necessarily separation related, but yeah. uh, the confinement definitely seemed to amp him up quite a bit, mm-hmm. right? So first step with all of that, again, just the negative punishment side of things. I'm yeah. not going to go right in and start correcting these things. I need the dog to start learning on their own that mm-hmm. some of that stuff doesn't work. Yeah. And we saw a reduction in it over the course of the first couple of days, like at, at work, for example, like when I create him at work now, he's pretty silent. I stick him in there. He doesn't really have an issue with it anymore. Yeah. Uh, He's pretty okay with, and the reason why I say it's confinement anxiety as opposed to separation anxiety is because he's pretty okay if I just leave him be if he's not confined. Like, for example, Mm -hmm. like when Steve just got here to help with a computer, I had him downstairs back tied to a chair Mm -hmm. down there. And we were up here for 15 minutes, and I actually forgot he was down there. That's a a me fault thing, right? (laughs) I kind of forgot he was down there. Oh, shit, I got to go down and get him. But he was silent, right? He didn't have any issues with it. But the crate, for whatever reason, once he's really sandwiched into that thing and realizes he can't get out or anything, that's what seems to really amp him up with it. Hmm. So second day, similar structure. The only difference is now I'm going to start tackling some of this stuff head on a little bit. Again, anytime he's out of the crate, he's got the leash on him. Um, I started really looking at, we have to start addressing these stairs. We have to start addressing him just walking in general because he really tried to kind of freeze up when he got that leash on. Mm. So worked on walking him up and down the stairs. And same deal, man. He threw a goddamn fit, man. Like we got to the top of the stairs. I'm getting him to try to just take one step down. He's freaking out, bucking on it. Finally, I get one, one step. You know, it's like, all right, good job, right? Then we get another one. Then we get another one. Then we get another one. And mm-hmm. it's like almost like I'm, I'm almost like needing to like drag him down these stairs, right? Yeah. But again, 14 weeks old already, right? We know that he could physically do this, right? Yeah. So we have to start getting him over that hurdle faster. Mm-hmm. And there's so many people out there that'll be like, take some food and get him to run up and down with the food and this and that, blah, yeah. blah, blah, keep it positive. The way that I've always looked at those things is with a young dog, my first goal with a dog is... Yes, build some motivation in certain areas, but establish leadership where the dog trusts that I'm going to guide them through safe situations, Mm. right? So I need him to understand when he feels this leash and I'm guiding him in a certain direction that no matter what, he is going to have to do that. And that's especially important with him because I realized as soon as I got him that he was a little bit more timid and scared of certain things. Like I said, Mm -hmm. the the confidence that we saw when he came in for that meet and greet, I think was a little bit more of a facade Mm -hmm. with the sister there and the foster there and stuff like that, you know? But Mm -hmm. he definitely does spook pretty easily by stuff. So when you have a fearful dog, it's even more important early on to establish that leadership because that helps you later on when you go to start, say, Mm off-leash stuff with the dog or you start putting the dog in different situations where you're in public and there's loud noises happening and stuff Mm -hmm. and they start trusting when they're scared they can start checking in with you and that you'll give them that proper guidance right Mm -hmm. where if you don't have that established and the dog gets spooked by something and doesn't want to do it you're shit out of luck because the dog's going to take off in the opposite direction yeah right so whatever so we started working on some of that leash stuff next day uh, really getting him up and down the stairs. He was rocky with it, but like over the course of the day, started getting a little bit better with it. Mm. Where he would still put the brakes on, but like he would actually start walking once I would kind of force him through it a little bit. Yeah. Um, same deal. Potty training was going really good with him. Next thing I was focused on was building some food drive with him. Mm. Right. So one thing I say when it comes to actual training, right, all of these things I'm doing with him are training, right? The yeah. establishing the leash pressure work, the making sure that he is always on the leash in the house so that he's not unsupervised at all, mm-hmm. um, taking him out to go to the bathroom, getting him used to the crate, right? Those are all training yeah. things, but a lot of people, when they think training, they think like obedience commands, right? Okay. So one thing I've always said is, or actually, I, I, uh, Tyler Mudo told me this one time when I was on the phone with him. He said, you know, if you're training your client's dogs in the same way that you're training your personal dogs, you're doing something wrong. And if you're training your personal dogs the same way you're training your client's dogs, you're doing something wrong. Basically, what he means by that is us as dog trainers. And this is something we talked about with like the Larry Crone stuff and, and kind of like how he like preaches not using corrections and this and that. Blah, 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 right? Yeah. So. What we mean by that is us as trainers should be skilled enough to manage 90% of behavioral issues, right? I can ensure this dog 
doesn't destroy anything in my house, doesn't piss all over my house, right? Um, can uh, not get himself into trouble, not attack my dogs, this, that, blah, 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 blah. I can ensure he could do all of those things without any obedience commands, right? Yeah. So I'm not in a rush to establish that kind of stuff, okay. right? Yeah. I can communicate the boundaries and I can teach him what's acceptable and what's not acceptable with all of those things, mm-hmm. which means that ultimately I have time, right? I have as mm-hmm. much time as I need to teach a lot of those different things. Mm-hmm. So because of that, we should be training things in a slightly different manner, right? So we don't need to rush into using our prong collars and using our e-collars and stuff like that. We mm-hmm. need, look at he's getting tangled up right now. He's up and moving. He's awake. He is. Oh, there we go. He's going back. So oh, no. he's right. done. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so, so we could spend our time, we could take our time teaching a lot of these other types of things, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we talked about kind of our, our, our general miracle canine training guide we would follow or our first steps are teaching leash pressure. Then we had e-collar in and we use the e-collar then to teach the commands itself and proof yeah. it and this and that where I have like three steps before any of this even happens that I typically would do with a young dog, right? Mm-hmm. Step number one is I'm focused on building food drive and building engagement, right? In a perfect world, yes, I would spend my time teaching everything with just positive reinforcement. Right? I want the yeah. dog to have a general understanding of these commands. I want them to have a good work ethic in association with these commands. And I'm going to take my time building that engagement so I could do that. So what does that look like? So in addition to all of those other things I was doing, during meal times, I started off right away with only feeding out of hand. Right, So I want this dog to make this correlation and this association with me being this ultimate source of good resources, mm-hmm. right? Now, that's okay that I'm doing that because I'm establishing my leadership elsewhere with the dog, right? So he's not going to just view me as a resource, but yep. he knows that not only am I going to create discipline and consequences for things, but I also will provide these really high value resources for him so mm-hmm. that I could capture his attention in different places, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So. Every day during my meal times, I would get his food, I'd portion it out, and I would feed it out of hand. And initially, no commands, no expectation, just eat it out of my hand. Follow mm-hmm. me around the room eating it out of my hand. Yeah. Right? So I did that for probably the first four days or so. Mm-hmm. Initially, again, he's trying to figure out what's going on. He's looking for the bowl. He's like, you know, where, where am I supposed to eat this stuff from? Until finally, after about four days or so, he was consistently glued to me and knew that food was coming from right here. That food was coming from right here. Right? Yeah. So now that I have that established, what we do is we start creating our communication, right? Mm -hmm. So I have the ability now to tell this dog no when I don't like what he's doing. And I could do that either via leash correction, walk Mm -hmm. over, give a little pop, which I've done with him. Uh, I could do that with um, a pet corrector. I have a little pet corrector downstairs that I'll use that I used originally if he was biting at the leash. Because a lot of people say, well, if you have the leash on the dog all the time, what happens if your dog bites the leash? Well, you do have to have a way to correct some of those types of things. So I had a little can of a uh, little can of air, right? That you use, yep. and anytime I would catch him with that leash in his mouth, I would tell him no, and I would go over and I'd give him a little spray with it, right? Yeah, that pretty much solved that problem right away. Yeah, right. So I have the ability to tell him no now. So now I need to have the ability to tell him yes. I know I have something that he wants, which mm-hmm. is the food. So I'm going to start establishing that yes marker. Yeah. So I'm doing some basic marker charging work, right? So I'm walking around. I tell him yes. I feed him. I tell him, mm-hmm. yes, I feed him. I tell him, yes, I feed him. Did that for about two days until I started seeing that word become kind of classically conditioned in, right? Because that's okay. what we're using. We're charging yeah. the marker. I want that word to have this immediate association of something positive happening, Yeah. right? Boom, got that established, right? Next step here, and this is what I actually started this morning. So now I have the food drive established, right? I have the... Um, the marker charged so I could start using it to shape some of these positions, right? Mm. I have my no established. I'm able to stop and deter some of these behaviors in as minimally aversive way as possible, mm-hmm. right? And uh, in addition to that, um, we have our leash walking that's flying along, right? After about day two, I pretty much said this dog is not getting picked up anymore, right? Yep. Unless it's something you literally cannot make the jump like into the back of the car or something like that, which yeah. that he's very close to being able to make. So, He's only got a little bit longer on yeah. that one as well. <laughs> uh, he's walking everywhere. And he hit a point yeah. where now stairs are no problem because Good. I didn't allow him to fight it, yeah. right? Uh, getting into crates is no problem. Where I used to pick him up and kind of put him in the crate to avoid that fight, now he follows that leash pressure into mm-hmm. the crate. Um, 
He's getting smoother and better with not being really noisy in the crate. Really, the only time we see it now is for the first 10 minutes or so at night Mm -hmm. where he'll start barking and stuff like that. And again, I'm sure I'll have to add a correction in for that at some point, Mm -hmm. but he's getting the general gist of it. His confidence is picking up through the engagement work and through the clear expectation of things. And because we've established the ropes and we don't let him out of sight and he's not having any potty training relating accidents because he's only ever gone outside. I don't think he's... I think he had maybe one accident where he started peeing on the floor and we caught it, took him outside right away, right? Aside from that, I don't think he's had a single accident Mm -hmm. in the week here or at the facility. Uh, He doesn't pee in his crate or anything, which is great. So now I can start to trust him and give him more freedoms. Now, more freedom does not mean unsupervised time, but in the evenings now when I get home from work, in the blocked off living room, dining room, kitchen area, we Mm -hmm. have the leash on him, but we just have it dragging. He's able to run around and play with the other dogs and stuff, Mm -hmm. right? And it's fine. And he chews on his toy. He's no problem with that. And we've been able to mitigate pretty much any problem that you would run into with this dog, right? Now, another note, we have a big fenced in yard, right? Our yard is almost an acre, and it's even though it's fully fenced in, yeah. I don't want to spend 10 years chasing this dog down in the backyard, right? Yeah. So we haven't let him off leash in the backyard yet, Yeah. right? So we're not, the, what I'm trying to get at with all of this is we're not letting the dog fail. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not putting him in situations right now where he's going to... Um, rehearse not listening to me or getting away with doing something that I don't want him to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm building the muscle memory of only doing appropriate things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's kind of the point is this stuff. It's not as hard as you, it's not as hard as you think. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. You just kind of have to control yourself a little bit of like, Oh my God, it's a cute puppy, but we're raising an adult dog. Yeah. Right. And because we're raising an adult dog, we need to focus on setting the boundaries first. Yep. Right. I could sit there and look at him and ogle at him all day long and look at how cute he looks right there and stuff like that. <laughs> but if I were to act on that and just smother this dog with yeah. love and affection 24 7 and not do any of those other things, yeah. you're going to have a disaster of a dog in about six months. Yeah. You know? And it's, like I said, it's been a pretty successful week because of all of that. <laughs>